This is Cultural Mixtapes. I'm Tejas Srinivasan. Welcome to the show. On today's episode, we have novelist and Zen Buddhist priest Ruth Ozeki. She's the author of several books, including A Tale for the Time Being, which was shortlisted for the 2013 Booker Prize, and her latest novel, The Book of Form and Emptiness, was published by Penguin Random House in 2021 and won the Women's Prize for Fiction in 2022. In addition to being a novelist, she also teaches creative writing at Smith College in Western Massachusetts. Ozeki's writing tackles a multitude of difficult metaphysical ideas while simultaneously maintaining a vivid narrative. The Book of Form and Emptiness is a story of a boy named Benny who starts hearing voices after the death of his father. The experience of hearing voices is where we started our conversation, but it quickly evolved into an exploration into the fictions of normality, the limitations of a Western worldview, the Buddhist philosophies of emptiness and impermanence, and many other topics. As Ozeki blended an explanation of meditation with a foray into her creative process, it's quickly apparent that for her, creating art and living intentionally amongst the noise of our world are not dissimilar. This conversation was immensely fascinating and altered my thinking both creatively and spiritually. Hope you enjoy the show. Ruth Ozeki, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Your latest novel, The Book of Form and Emptiness, is about a boy named Benny who starts hearing voices after the death of his father. And the book brings a lot of nuance into the shape that these voices take, as well as how outsiders without the same experience react to his hearing of voices. Mm. And I personally have not really had the experience of hearing voices. So to start off, Could you take us through your thinking about voice hearing and how you chose to craft these really vibrant and vivid experiences that you do in your novel? Sure, sure. I mean, I think the whole book in some way started with a voice hearing experience I had. Um, Mm -hmm. It was after the death of my father. And um, this was in back in 1998. So it was quite a while ago. For about a year after he died, I would occasionally you know, be doing something pretty random and ordinary, like washing the dishes or folding laundry or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I would hear him behind me. And it was always just behind me to the right side somehow. And I would hear him clear his throat and say my name, just Ruth, you know, Mm -hmm. in this, in a kind of a soft voice, like he was maybe three feet or so behind me. And every time this happened, I'd turn around and, you know, of course, expecting to see him there because it was just such a, you know, it was such a sudden and clear experience. Um, And I'd turn around and expect to see him. And of course, he wouldn't be there because he was dead. And every time that happened, of course, I'd remember, you know, and and that memory, the memory would kind of come back to me, the grief would kind of come back to me. And it was it was really disturbing. But at the same time, I mean, it was sad, and I would miss him all over again. And so this happened maybe five or six times over the course of about a year. I can't really remember. It would happen, you know, the experience was so quick and so fleeting, and then it would be over and then I'd kind of forget about it and go back to what I was doing. It didn't really lodge as an experience until many, many years later when I started to think about um, hearing voices. Um, and I was thinking particularly about um, you know, hearing uh, the voices of characters, you know, fictional characters coming Mm -hmm. to me. And I always talk about fictional characters like that. I always talk about how, you know, characters come to me as voices um, or books, novels come to me as voices. And I was speaking that way at an event I was doing. Um, This man in the audience raised his hand and he said, well, what does that mean? You know, he said, do you mean literally you hear the voices of your characters as if they are outside you, as if with your ears, or is it more of a kind of internal hearing? Um, is it more like hearing it with your mind? When he asked that question, of course, you know, it, for me, it was a, it's a kind of more internal hearing. It's mm-hmm. like I hear the voices with my mind. But I suddenly recalled that experience I'd had with my dad's voice. And um, it turns out that this man who was asking the question had a son who was a voice hearer, And his voices were very disturbing to him. And so we ended up talking about this quite a bit. Um, Now, I have friends who are voice hearers as well. And I have friends who are working in the voice hearing communities. 
you know, it really got me thinking. I kind of put it all together, um, realizing that, you know, that, that I have an array of voices that I hear um, in very different ways. Um, you know, some of the voices are like my dad's voice outside as, and I'm hearing them as if with my ear, but there are these other voices that are more internal, the voices of characters, you know, the voice of the muse. And then there are also, you know, all of those neurotic voices that we all hear, right, that are telling us that whatever it is that we're doing at the moment probably sucks. And we should probably think about getting a real job instead of trying to write another novel. And so there's just so many different ways that we can interpret this. There's so many different ways that we can think about voice hearing. Um, and I guess that's really what the, the book, that's how the book started. And in the novel, as I mentioned before, there's several different types of voices and experiences that your character has in the book. Some of these experiences are quite difficult to read, and it's often easy to faux diagnose him with some sort of schizoaffective disorder. And some of them are as simple as the cliched angel and devil on each shoulder or something like Mm -hmm. that. And if there's one thing you can learn from the novel, it's that voice hearing is an intensely personal experience. How did you go about treading the line between, I guess... I don't want to trivialize it, but healthy Mm. voice hearing and Mm. essentially experiences that can be traumatic. Yeah. I mean, our, you know, our culture is so quick to pathologize voice hearing. I mean, I always think about, I always think about um, how ironic it is that, you know, that the fathers of, you know, the the so-called fathers of, of, you know, modern psychology, you know, uh, Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung both talked about the voices that they heard. And, Mm -hmm. and Jung writes about this at, at, at some length, but I can imagine that if, if, Carl Jung walked into a modern psychiatrist's office and, and said, well, you know, I, I have these hallucinations and I, and I see these voice and I hear these voices and I can control them. And it, he would be, he would be diagnosed with psychosis and put on lithium. We're so entrenched in this biomedical um, approach to um, mental states, right? Yeah. And my, my sense is that there's a huge variety of, as I said, voice hearing experiences. And as you said, it's very personal. And, you know, some of these voice hearing, these kinds of voice hearing um, are celebrated by our culture. Like when I hear the voices of my characters speaking to me, you know, people think that's great. You know, and I'm I'm patted on the back for that. Right. Um, I'm I'm rewarded for that. Whereas other people, you know, hearing voices um, would be would be locked up for exactly the same kind of thing it really boils down to, you know, what it is that we consider to be normal. And normal is a very interesting idea. It's a very interesting word because it's a, it's a, it's made up. It's a fiction. It's a yeah. cultural construct, right? We made up this idea of normal and, and it's a complete fiction. So if that's the case, you know, as a fiction writer, I would say, let's redefine normal. Let's, let's expand normal um, so that it can be more inclusive, you know, so that it can be more generous and be more compassionate. Um, because it turns out that, in fact, many people hear voices, but they're not necessarily disturbed by them. And I can, I think that is, you know, to, to go back to your question, I think that's really the key there. If a person who's hearing voices finds it disturbing, then it needs to be addressed somehow. Yeah. How it's addressed, again, there's so many different ways. Sometimes, you know, psychopharmaceuticals can be helpful um, to some people. I can't rule that out. But on the other hand, you know, there are so many other ways and, and there's a real wonderful, vibrant, exciting movement of um, what community support, peer support that is growing up, not just in this country, really, it, I think a lot of it started in England. It's very encouraging that, that there are different ways now that people who hear voices and are disturbed by this experience, you know, can find help and support from others who are living, having the same kinds of lived experience. Mm-hmm. You say redefine what normal is, and Mm. normal is a fictional construct. Outside of literary writing, how do you think we can go about (laughs) doing something like that? Yeah, good question, right? Well, it's happening all the time, isn't it? In areas of um, social justice, we're trying, right? We're trying to do that. Race, gender, you know, we're trying to redefine and and become more non-binary. I think that's the problem is that particularly in the West, the West is a very binary culture. In the East, we talk more about, you know, non-duality and, and recognize non-duality as a better model for the nature of reality. But in the, in the West, you know, we're, we're still fixated on good and evil, 
and yeah. and we tend to break the world down into you know these binary oppositions that are irreconcilable you know in the west we are always framing everything in terms of either or yeah. either this or this either male or female either normal or crazy and and that is actually not a very accurate way of describing reality as a zen buddhist i try very hard to retrain myself to think about things as both and that and i think that is a much more accurate way of describing things as they are this idea of non-duality that you said comes from eastern philosophy could you say a little bit more about where that comes from yeah sure well i mean i think that certainly buddhist philosophy teaches that non well exactly what i just said non-duality is a um is a more accurate you could even say healthier way of mm -hmm. viewing the world that our minds are conditioned for various reasons to think about things in in you know dualistic terms but if you really if you really start to think about it if you really sit with these phenomenon you you start to realize that that you know that no it's 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 the gray area that makes up most of reality you yeah. know we live we live in the gray area and and so to insist on these rigid categories of you know these either or black and white categories right mm -hmm. um it is um is inaccurate and it, it leads to a lot of suffering you started touching on zen buddhist philosophy and mm -hmm. i want to go deeper into that. In some places in the novel throughout, you write of the eponymous form and emptiness as, from what I can understand, a sort of derivative state that needs to be achieved or worked towards. From my dilettantish knowledge of topics like this, I started relating emptiness to a loose understanding of nothingness, which I've heard mm. people describe as, I guess, of a goal during meditation. Mm. Could you explain some of your thinking about the way you used emptiness? Sure, sure. Um, emptiness is a Buddhist term. Um, it, the, I think the Sanskrit is sunyata, and it went through various translations as it, you know, as the concept moved from India to the East, um, and and also to Tibet, and and then also to the West, right? And and so in the West, we ended up getting stuck with this word emptiness, right? Yeah. And emptiness is a is a it's not a really good translation. Uh -huh. You know, the the character, the Japanese character that's used for emptiness is the character for sky, right? Okay. But you would never really think of the sky as empty, right? The sky yeah. is not empty, right? Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, in the same way, the word emptiness, unfortunately, has this kind of nihilistic void-like <laughs> connotation, which I think is the opposite of emptiness, because I think emptiness is actually everythingness. It's the contrasting state to form, right? Okay. In other words, it's formlessness. It's the substance of the world before, before it's taken form, right? And so the way I like to think about the relationship between form and emptiness, a metaphor that works for me is imagine emptiness as this vast, vast ocean right? And it's so vast that you really, you just can't see, there's no shoreline visible, there's no horizon visible, it's just this vast ocean of emptiness, right? Mm -hmm. Then, you know, the planet turns and the winds start to blow and the moon waxes and wanes and, you know, the tides start to pull. And from all of that, all of those conditions, those changing conditions, um, a little wave starts to emerge, right? And the wave pokes its, you know, starts to form and it pokes its little head up, right? Mm -hmm. And it develops a little white cap on its head, right? And it sort of looks around, right? And sees all of this emptiness around it. And the wave thinks, wow, this is fantastic. Look at me. You know, I'm something, right? Mm -hmm. I'm a wave. I have form. I have substance, right? I'm going to last forever, and of course, then the planet spins, the tides shift, you know, the moon waxes or wanes, and then the little wave starts to subside back down into the ocean. And, you know, the wave doesn't like this. The wave hates this because yeah. the wave really was something. And now it's coming back into, into emptiness again. So that is really a kind of metaphor for everything. And certainly for us, you know, I mean, that's exactly our relationship with life, you know, with our human form. Um, you know, we come into existence, we come into form, and then we subside back into emptiness. It's that movement from form to emptiness 
um, that uh, really is describing everything that we think of as reality. And in the book, what you're saying sounds very similar to passages where you write about humanity's organic relationship to the world, um, whether that's a realization that mm. the main character Benny has or in other places. There, a term that comes up is dependent co-arising. And yes. I've heard you mention this in other interviews as well. Is that a term for what you just mentioned? Or? Yes, it is. Exactly. Exactly. And I should also contextualize this. The, the term form and emptiness comes from the a very central uh, sutra in Mahayana Buddhism called the Heart of Great Wisdom Sutra and the Prajnaparamita Sutta. And the, the lines in the sutra are, well, in the English translation is um, uh, form is not different from emptiness. Emptiness is not different from form. Form itself is emptiness emptiness itself form. So the wave and the ocean cannot be separated from each other. They mm -hmm. are dependently co-arising. Okay. The wave literally, you know, co-arises out of the ocean. Mm -hmm. It could not exist without the ocean. It will also subside back into the ocean. And, and so that's the dependent co-arising part of it. In other words, the re and the reason this happens is because of impermanence. Nothing in reality as we know it is permanent. Everything is always in a state of change and a state of flux, yeah. right? And so, you know, because of impermanence, um, there is dependent co-arising, right? And the other sort of Buddhist truth this points to is the truth of no self. Nothing, including the wave, has no fixed and abiding self. And this is very difficult for us to understand yeah. because, or we can understand it rationally, right? It's, it's easy enough to understand it rationally, especially when you're my age, you know, it's, <laughs> you know, it's very easy to, to see, you know, yes, I'm 66 years old. And, and, you know, I, I know that, you know, that the end is much closer than it was when I was your age. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but it's still very, it, it's hard to really grasp because the self is so convincing, yeah. right? <laughs> like I am really, really convinced that I am, you yeah. know, that I am this self, right? And um, and it's very hard to to sort of drop that notion, right? Mm. Let that notion go. But if you look at reality, sort of look at life realistically, you know, of course you have to accept that. Now, with all these ideas floating around in consciousness. All of a sudden, meditation seems infinitely more complicated <laughs> when factoring all this in. Um, I've had experiences with my dad where he challenged me to sit down and think of nothing and clear my mind. And it's near impossible. Yeah. And feel free to be as detailed or as general as you'd like. With all these ideas in play, how do you teach meditation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, you see, I guess I don't think about meditation as clearing the mind. That might be an outcome of meditation, uh -huh. but it's not something that, that you can really aim at directly yeah. because the more you try to clear your mind, the worse it's going to get. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, so the trick is not trying, right. The trick okay. is to not try. Don't try so hard. I think this is true for just about anything. It's certainly true for writing. When I try really hard to write something, it doesn't work. I have to stop trying. Right. And I have to kind of relax. There's a sense of just letting go. And when I let go, that's when the writing starts to happen. That's when the, you know, that's when meditation starts to happen. And so the way I have been thinking about meditation these days is that it's a, you know, it's almost a physical relaxation exercise. And so when I teach meditation, I always start with the body. I don't start with the mind. The mind is, you know, is separate um, or it's not separate, but I don't talk about the mind. Partly because I think that in the West, we're so fixated on the mind and mental phenomenon yeah. um, and mental activity. You know, we're, we're just obsessed with our minds, right? We're trapped in our minds. And so mm -hmm. I, I move it immediately. I, I move people's attention from the mind to the body. And we start with a body scan, just mm -hmm. like in yoga. We you know, start with a body scan, sort of guide people to uh, bring their awareness to different parts of their body so that they feel at the end of this, like fully embodied. And, and what that does, of course, is it brings one's awareness out of the head, yeah. right, and into the body. Um, and then um, very often what I will do is direct people to bring their awareness to their senses. You know, when I meditate, I meditate with my eyes slightly open in my traditions. And, and we call the senses the sense gates. Okay, so mm -hmm. the eyes are a sense gate, nose is a sense gate, you know, mouth, 
ears, right? These are all sense gates. Just sort of being aware of all of the sensory information that's coming in. It's a kind of gentle, diffuse awareness of all of that sensory awareness, the, the sounds outside the room, the kind of quality of light, the residual tastes of lunch in your mouth, you know, whatever it happens to be, yeah. right? The pain in your, you know, in your back as you're sitting, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. All of this, this sensory information is kind of gently and diffusely in your awareness. From there, I guide people to just be aware of the breath. Right. And just mm -hmm. watch the breath coming in and out without trying to control it in any way. Just watching it again, very gentle type of observation. And then if thoughts come, right, which they will, they will. Yeah. Absolutely thoughts will come because that's what minds are meant to think. Right. Yeah. So thoughts will come. And when they do, it's no big deal. You know, at some point you become aware of your thoughts. You know, you, aware, you become aware that you've drifted away from your cushion or whatever it is you're sitting on. You've drifted away from your meditation and you're thinking about, you know, your homework um, and, and you become aware of that. And then you relax, you know, again, you mm -hmm. just relax and let that thought go. Again, a metaphor that I really like is uh, the metaphor of the mind as a hand, relaxing the hand of the mind, right? So when a thought comes... Most of the time, what we do when a thought comes is we grab onto it and we make a fist, right? And we try to hold on to that thought. And when you do that, the thought will take you away, right? It'll pull you off. Mm -hmm. um, so instead of that, you know, when you notice a thought, you don't grab onto it, you do the opposite. You relax the hand of the mind and bring your awareness back to the breath, back to the body, and the thought will take care of itself. It'll go away on its own. Right. And the practice of meditation then is doing that over and over and over and over and over a hundred million times. Yeah. It'll never, it never stops. We often call meditation the practice of return. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's what it is. It's the practice of coming back to this relaxed, open handed, open minded, fully embodied state. Right. It's just coming back to it again and again and again. So it's the practice of return. As long as you keep coming back, yeah. you're meditating. When you say practice of return, and then some of the other descriptions that you just said in terms of letting go as well as being more attuned to your sense gates, that almost seems like, in a way, a writing process of yes. receiving ideas. How have you related the two, or are they one and the same for you? They're one and the same. Exactly. They're one and the same. In the same way that, you know, when you meditate, if you're trying to meditate, it just doesn't work, right? No, no. And, and, and so the same thing is true for the writing. So what I do is I, I just sit in a meditate, you know, I sit in meditation posture and I just relax, you know, mm -hmm. I just try to relax. I do exactly that. Focus on my, you know, bring my awareness to my, you know, to my body, to my sense gates. The other thing, interesting thing while we're talking about this is that in Buddhist psychology mm -hmm. um the mind is considered to be just another sense gate okay so okay. your mind is just like your ear or your eye or your sense of smell mm -hmm. right and so in the same way that your eye perceives sight yeah. and your nose perceives smell and your ears perceive sound your mind perceives thoughts and emotions right mm -hmm. and okay. so what that does is it it means that a thought and an emotion like say a, a, an angry thought is really nothing more than a bad smell. Yeah. You know, or an unpleasant sound. Right. And it does not going to last forever. It'll pass. And the same is true for thoughts, right? They just come and go in the same way that smells and sounds and sights come and go. That to me is, you know, as somebody brought up in the West where, you know, we've all, we have such a radical kind of body mind, duality yeah. right a split between our bodies and minds right that to me is a very comforting thought um you know a very comforting way to to experience my mind as being nothing more than another sense gate right it's just another you know sort of portal through which information flows that relates to yeah. writing a lot more right because of course you know when we're when we're writing we're very much using our minds right mm -hmm. um but we're also i would argue using our bodies because if you can't write embodied language, then your reader is not going to be able to feel their way into your subjectivity. Fiction is all about a reader feeling their way into, you know, the subjectivity of the character. 
right? Yeah. Which is my subjectivity as the writer. I want to switch gears a little bit mm. to another topic that factors big into the book, which is Benny's father, who passes away pretty early, was a jazz clarinetist. And throughout the book, you have recordings, famous recordings that you mentioned that most people would recognize. And the characters are listening to music, playing records throughout. I may be biased, but mm -hmm. I feel like this experience of listening to music creates an impalpable feeling that I don't feel is dissimilar from what you just mentioned from the idea of emptiness. So when you were writing this book, how did music, I guess, come into the mix? Mm. I always have a playlist. Part of writing, part of writing a novel is making a playlist. Okay. Early on in the writing process, you know, I'll, a song will, you know, usually it's a kind of serendipity, you know, where mm -hmm. I'll be writing and, you know, listening to Spotify or something and, and a song will come on and there'll be just this kind of electrical connection between what it is that I'm hearing and what it is that I'm writing. Oh, okay. and it's like a little spark. And, and so then that song will be part of the playlist. And then when I hear that song again, it evokes the same feeling, right, mm -hmm. th that, that I had when I was writing. Um, and so it's a way of shortcutting back into the body mind that I was in when I was writing that particular scene or that particular okay. character, right? Um, you know, you could talk about it as kind of creating the mood for the piece, yeah. right? So in any case, yeah, I, for every book that I've written, I've always had a playlist. And very often the song titles um, find their way in to the, you know, to the text um, because they end up certainly in this case, you know, Kenji, the Japanese jazz clarinetist, you know, he, he's a Benny Goodman, yeah. you know, he, he loves Benny Goodman. Um, and so then Benny Goodman, you know, really found his way and the music found its way in, into the story itself. Um, and it's just fun to do that. Yeah. But it's also, you know, it's, it's fun, but it's also for me, just useful. You know, because when I listen to Benny Goodman now, when I listen to Swing, 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 for example, I'm just, it's like, I'm right there. You know, I can, I can, I can, I'm in that scene where, you know, where Benny and Kenji are listening to the recording from that 1938 Carnegie Hall concert, you yeah. know, and, and they're, they're listening to the drum solo. It's like, I can hear it now, even as we're, you know, even as we're speaking, I can close my eyes and hear that and immediately like time traveling, you know, just brought right back into that scene. Wonderful. Is it just jazz or do other genres? Oh, it's it, any, yeah, it's all sorts of, all sorts of genres. I'll send you the um, link to my Spotify playlist for, uh, for the book of form and emptiness. You can, oh, you can lovely. post the link if you want. I, will, yeah. I absolutely yeah. will. Yeah. yeah. There was a lot of, you know, sort of spacey music in Ooh, there. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Cause the space metaphors are, um, you know, are so strong in the book. Mm -hmm. Another thing that's present throughout the book is this dichotomy between the outside world and the personal world mm. parallel to all the personal struggles that these characters have throughout that we've touched on. You recount generalized versions of world events, whether that's political developments, activist developments, natural developments, so on and so forth. What was your thinking behind illustrating the complicated relationship that people have between dealing with their own personal world as well as dealing with the outside? Yeah, well, isn't it the situation that we all find ourselves in now, exactly, right? You exactly. know, I mean, we, we've never had more information to process in the course of a day or the course mm -hmm. of a life, you know, and, and there's no way to keep it out. You know, there's, there's absolutely no way not to know anymore. Mm -hmm. And this has been especially true in the last well, since 2016, yeah. you know, the voices that are coming in from the outside are increasingly violent and, and obnoxious and stupid. And the cognitive dissonance that I feel is painful at times. And I think this is true for everyone. The voices, you know, from the outside world are unstoppable now. And so Benny's mom, Annabelle, um, she has this job, um, which used to be a very quiet job. You know, she, she was a news clipper. And, and so she worked in a company where she would read newspapers and clip articles that her clients were interested in. And, and you know, a very kind of quiet, contemplative job, really, when you think yeah. about it. But then, of course, you know, it shifted. You know, more and more information started coming 
in through radio and television and, yeah. you know, and then the internet, oh my God. And then her company downsized. And so she was sent to work from home. And so all of these voices are now literally intruding into her living room. Yeah. And, and so it's no wonder her child, Benny, was having such a hard time with his voice hearing because he literally was hearing these voices all the time. And so was his mom. Um, and I think that just is a is is kind of a metaphor for all of us now. Mm. That same experience that you write, I almost saw it as allegorical to the experience of reading fiction. Like when mm. I pick up a nice fat novel like Midnight's Children or Tom Jones or something like that, I sort of have to manage existing in two worlds. <laughs> That's right. Was that was that intentional or yes. is that just me? Okay. No, no, no. And and do you write? I. Attempt to, yes. Yeah, well, so then you write. Okay, so, and do you write fiction? Slowly starting to. Yeah, yeah. okay. So then you, you know this, how difficult it is to live in, in, in your fictional world and yeah. in, your, in the so-called real world, you know, the, mm -hmm. the world that is your so-called non-fictional world. <laughs> you know, in the course of writing, I mean, this book, The Book of Form and Emptiness, took me eight years to write. Oh, wow. And so, yeah, so I had to sustain those dual worlds, those adjacent worlds, mm -hmm. and be able to switch back and forth and live in both of them uh, for eight years. But that's true for every book. I mean, the previous book, A Tale for the Time Being, also took about eight years to write. And so I had to live um, with one foot in both worlds. With practice, you get better at it. Um, mm -hmm. the, the trick, I think, the really crucial skill that a novel writer today needs to develop is the, first of all, the, the skill of saying no to a lot of things that are fun, right? Yeah. Um, you, you have to, you can't do everything, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I end up saying no to a lot of things that I wish I could do, but I just can't. Mm -hmm. um, because what I need is I need vast quantities of uninterrupted, unscheduled time. Yeah. And that is increasingly <laughs> difficult and precious, you know, in, mm -hmm. increasingly difficult to find and, and increasingly precious. And then when I do have a stretch of unscheduled time, um, I have to close down completely. I don't check my cell phone and I don't check my internet. And I, I have hard walls up um, that, I, that I keep in place to protect me um, so that I can just drift into that that fictional world and just stay there even if i don't manage to write anything at all just to kind of be there in that world is is really that that's part of the writing wonderful yeah. and finally our last question mm. while we're on the topic of drifting into other worlds yeah what have you been reading watching or listening to that you've been excited about lately oh dear um i you know it's funny because whenever anybody asks me that question i kind of panic um but let's see now. Um, I am now reading Barbara Kingsolver's new novel called okay. Demon Copperhead. And yeah. it is unbelievable. Okay. It's so good. It's a complete world. It's actually modeled on uh, David Copperfield. Oh, wow. Okay. Right. So it's Demon Copperhead uh, set, set in the American South. Right. Ooh. So, yeah, really, really good. So that is a complete world right and that's my that's where i am fictionally mm -hmm. um another book though that i just finished before that um was susanna clark's piranesi okay oh you must read it okay oh my god it's so good i just i can't even begin to describe how Wonderful. amazing this book is um it again just a completely imagined world bizarre weird sad oh I have to say, it's not often that I read a book and I think, damn, if I could have written that book, I would, I would be completely happy. I would die happy. Um, I, I feel envy towards mm -hmm. that. I've been kind of dabbling around in, in some nonfiction too, but those are really the two that, that are standout books right now. Wonderful. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure to have you on. Sure. Thank you so much. And that's our show. Special thanks to Ruth Ozeki for joining me on this episode. To learn more about her work and see a list of her recommendations, visit the show notes. Cultural Mixtapes is written and produced by me, Tejas Srinivasan. The music you heard on today's episode was Beethoven's Sonata No. 26 and Chopin's Sonata No. 2, recorded by me. If you liked what you heard, 
please subscribe, review, and share on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you listen. Thank you very much for listening.